good to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, we, the scripture today comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. This is the command, the statutes and ordinances the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you so that you may follow them in the land you are about to enter and possess. Do this so that you may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life by keeping his statute, all his statutes and commands I am giving you, your son and your grandson, hijos y nietos, and so that you may live long, may have a long life. Listen, Israel, be careful to follow them so that you may prosper and multiply greatly because the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 4, listen, Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These words that... I am giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them with your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. And amen. If you got your Bibles real quickly, if you could go with me to um, Deuteronomy chapter 6. You can go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. We want to look at verses 1 through 9. Um, very pointed message this morning. I know we've been in a series on the gifts, but we're going to bag out of that uh, this week as we talk a little bit about the legacy building blueprint. The legacy building blueprint. Uh, the legacy building blueprint. The legacy building blueprint. When you have Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 9, simply say, Amen. 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 You know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Amen. Hallelujah. Listen to the word of the Lord on this morning uh, as, I, as I endeavor uh, to come to you with this word. The legacy building blueprint. Look what the Bible says. This is the command, the statutes and the ordinances. The Lord God has commanded me to teach you so that you may follow them in the land you are about to enter and to possess. Do this, that you may fear the Lord your God with all, all the days of your life by keeping all the statutes, commands I'm giving you, your son and your grandson, so that you may have a long life. Listen, Israel, and be careful to follow them so that you may prosper and multiply greatly because the Lord, the God, the God of your ancestors has promised you a land flowing with milk and honey. Listen, Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your strength. These words that I am giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts door post of your house and on your city gates. You may be seated in the presence of our life-changing king. Man, it's super excited this morning to be here on Father's Day and to see uh, I was at the door and I was watching the men as they were walking in with their wives and their children and it did my heart great good because we live in a culture where uh, masculinity and manhood is under attack and we live in a culture particularly where people want to say that men are absent but I want to I wish I could turn the camera around and say uh, not so here and the task of seat of Texas at Higher Expectations Church. Amen. So let's give the men a big hand of praise on this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. Our text this morning presents us with what I call a cultural moment. A cultural moment. It's as if we're looking into a mirror in time and seeing ourselves in a movie reel. Moses has been addressing the children of Israel as he prepares them to, as he prepares to leave them in a world and among a people with a variety of different value systems and beliefs. 
Moses is trying to get them ready to possess the promised land. He's telling them, you've been kind of marshalling along as a group, but now you're going to have to be in a world, but not of the world. He, he's, he's trying to prepare them for a cultural moment. As a leader, Moses recognized that the stakes are high. So he's laid a foundation in chapters 1 through 5, amen, with chapter 5, where he lays out the Ten Commandments to them. This foundation that is faithfully adhered to will honor God and leave a, leg, a, a legacy, a lasting legacy for generations to come. Moses knows that although they have the Ten Commandments written in stones, that the people's hearts will be changed unless, they, unless God has a way of, uh, of showing them how to live and love them, and they're actually written on their hearts. See, it's easy to have the words of Scripture. It's easy to have nice plaques on the walls in our houses and in our buildings and on our businesses and even tattooed on our bodies. But unless what God wants and desires for us and for the next generation is written on the tablets of our hearts, as the song says, then it will be missed. We will not see the fruit that God has intended for us. Here's the reality of what we face and what they faced then and what we face today. Information about God is not enough to lead to obedience towards God. You say, Pastor, how do you know that? I had a lot of information and I was still not obedient to the scriptures. Here is our reality. In a generation, we have, we, we have the full canon. We have 66 books. But unless we allow God's word and God's way to penetrate our hearts, we run the risk of being what I call spiritual zombies. Just walking around alive but really dead on the inside. A shell of who and what we are supposed to be. However, there are even greater implications to ignoring God's truth and applying them to our lives. There is the risk of losing the next generation to, 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 to the appetites of this world. The Bible is clear. It says that a good man, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Proverbs 13, 22. We love quoting this verse, but often we miss its intent. God is never concerned with our earthly wealth to the degree that it overshadows our life in him. Leave them a car, some cash, and even a few cribs. But leave them Christ as the centerpiece of their life. If I lose everything, but I still have him, I have the world's most prized possession. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. But it goes on to say, but a sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. The Bible illustrate, illustrator states it this way. The happiness of men depends less on external conditions than on their personal virtues. A good man is satisfied from himself. The effects of a man's habits are transmitted to his children and even to their descendants. My aunts would often catch me doing crazy things and they would say to me, you're just like your daddy. Nothing my daddy taught me. Nothing he, he didn't give me a class. Well, he did teach me how to play poker. Uh, <laughs> but, but most of what I learned from my dad, I learned watching him. Uh, he, 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 would, he would often tell me while drinking, boy, I bet not ever catch you with a drink in your hand. I'm going to beat the snot out of you. Some of y'all heard that before. But the reality of it is he was drinking while telling me not to do it. And, and I've learned through living this short life that more is caught than taught. I wanted to know what made him what made him taste the whiskey so much? Why, why was he so attracted to it? And so at 14, I started dipping and dabbling, not because he set me down and said, check this out, but because I had watched him do it for so long. I noticed that if my wife bags me into a corner, and she could be totally right, that I come out of that corner like a, like a bulldog, like a rock wild. 
just crazy as all get out. My dad used to say crazy as the best of bugs. Now, again, 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 but the Bible tells me that I'm supposed to be gentle with her. Where did I get that from? I got that simply from my dad. I noticed that when my mom would bag my dad in the corner and, 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 and he had no other way of escape, he would come out like a rock wilder. You say, Pastor, why do you bring that up? Because more is caught than taught. The markers and the cues that we're leaving for the next generation will be passed on from generation to generation. And if we're going to build a lasting legacy, there are some things in our own lives that we must challenge ourselves with and be willing to change. So I want to keep you alone today because the Bible is calling us to leave a spiritual legacy that far outweighs or outpaces the material inheritance we could pass on. Let me be clear. God wants you to pass on some material stuff. He wants you to leave an inheritance for the next generation, if, all, if at all possible. But more important than the things that you're going to leave, amen, is the spiritual deposits that you will make that will be passed on from one generation to the next. So here, look at me. Uh, with me at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 2, I promise. Amen. I'm going to get us out of here. I know, I know a lot of us have plans. Some of y'all are cooking good meals today. Some of y'all have already got your reservations laid out. Amen. Some of y'all have already uh, 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 fixed things up and, and, and y'all are ready to go. And so I need you to tune in with me just for the next few points. And I promise, amen, I'm going to give you something to hold on to, amen, and something to think about. And, and, and not only will this here apply to the Father, others in, in this room, but this applies to all of us who are put in a place, amen, where we can be a spiritual mentor or make spiritual deposits in the life of the next generation. So here it is, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. We often start at verse 4 and run uh, verses 4 through 6, but we miss the mark because we will not always understand the full context without reading and starting here. So look what he says. This is the command. This is a command. The statue and audience and audiences, the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you so that you may follow them in the land you are about to enter. Do this that you may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life, keeping all his statues and commands I'm giving you, your son and your grandson, and so that, so that you may have long life. Here it is. God says the key to long life is obeying God keeping his word. You know, one of the things that I learned, long life is relative. Long life is relative. Amen. Because we all know somebody younger than us that's not here right now. And if they, and if, and if they could come back and say anything to you, they, they would say, you're an old man. You've lived a long life. If I live one day longer than my best friend, guess what? I've lived a longer life. But, 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 but here it is, here it is. Think about this. When building a house, a very calculated process is placed in motion. An architect has to design the whole, uh, the, whole, the whole deal. He has to measure every inch of the home. He has to know where every window go, every faucet go, every wire goes, amen. He then gives his plan to a civil engineer who lays out for him how the foundation of that house should be laid. That civil engineer then gives the plan to a builder. We call them specs, and he has to build the house to those specs. To, to, to those specs. But if the foundation is raggedy and broken, amen, that house will not stand the test of time and the storms that are to come. That's why Moses lays out the foundation for them in Deuteronomy 6, 1 and 2. He says that the first foundation is that we must obey the command, statutes, and ordinance of the Lord. Fathers, we have a responsibility to ensure the next generation knows more about God than they know about Big Mama. You may, you may have aspirations to raise a great ball player, a nurse, a surgeon, a lawyer, and these are very good. But that is not the primary and most critical deposit that you can make in your child's life. The primary responsibility is that you teach them who God is and that you will train them to obey God even when they don't listen to you. Amen. 
You say, how can you train them to obey God when they don't listen to me? Because sometimes I feel like a nut and sometimes I don't. (laughs) God says, turn the other cheek. And sometimes I will whisper in my son's ear, you better go fight. You're going to fight them or fight me. And then by the time they're in high school and they're fighting all the time, you're wondering where it came from. No. The primary responsibility is to teach them uh, and train them who God is and to obey him. The, this is the key to a great and productive and prosperous life. Consider, consider the continuity of Scripture. Consider how God does not change. Look with me real quick in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. This is so helpful. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Look what it says. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord because this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. It says, honor, first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you, so that you may have long life in the land. Now, this is Paul talking, not Moses. So for those who want to argue, that's Old Testament stuff. We're now in the New Testament, and Paul is saying the same thing. Paul has just told us in chapter 5 of Ephesians what marriage looks like between a husband and wife, and Paul goes on and says, and this is how you raise children. But then it is in verse 4 that it is verse 4 that should stir us up. He says, fathers, 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 biological fathers, spiritual fathers. Foster fathers, adopted fathers, mentoring fathers. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. In other words, listen, don't just pick at them. Here's the point. Don't beat them down with wayward words, but build them up with God's word and God's way. We're called to nourish and educate them, equip them, and edify them so that we can shoot them like arrows. You want to know why some men never leave home? Here's why. Because they were not nourished and trained in the things of God. They were coddled. He says, no, don't coddle them. He says, prepare them. Prepare them. Prepare them. My son walked in, and he can verify the story. He was about 18, and he was clowning. He was getting in trouble, and I got him out of little trouble. And so one day, I said, what you you planning on doing? You planning on going to college? He says, I don't know what I'm going to do. I said, come on, let's take a ride. We hopped in the car. We drove up 1960. We turned by the movie tavern, and right there was the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, and the Army. I said, now, and across the street was the mall. I say, now, these fellas are hiring every day. And if you go across the mall, they're hiring every day. But I'm going to leave you right here. When you figure out which organization you want to work for, give me a call. I'll be back. (laughs) Eleven years later, I have a beautiful daughter-in-law and an awesome grandson. Amen. And a son who's raising his sons in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Because it was, my, it was not my responsibility, amen, to continue to hold him and coddle him. It was my responsibility to give him a shove so that he could become all that God wanted him to be and all that the army wanted him to be at the same time. <laughs> amen. Here's the point. Listen, even if you didn't get this as a child, You can still give it to your child, even if you weren't nourished and and, and loved on and and hugged on. You still have the capacity within you to do it for your child and for another child because you have something in you. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. If you're full of the spirit, you have the ability to do it. Amen. You have all of the wisdom that you need. Amen. To lead the next generation. That's why Psalms 119 11 says. In keeping with what Moses has told them in these first two verses, and what he's getting at, he says, he says, ensure that they know who God is. That's the first foundation to building a lasting legacy in the next generation. Ensure that they know who God is. Ensure that they know. Amen. 
How can a young man keep his ways pure? Here it is by keeping it according to your word. I sought you with my whole heart. Do not let me wander from your command. Psalms 119, 9 and 11. I have treasured your words in my heart and, and, and so that I might not sin against you. If you want to build a lasting legacy for the next generation, ensure that they know who God is. So I'm going to help us. Right? This is my next point. Instill obedience in them. Instill obedience in them. Instill obedience in them. The Bible says obedience is better than sacrifice. And, the, and there's a little verse in the Bible that says, a man, discipline a child that won't kill them, but the rod of correction will drive folly far from them. Folly's in a child, but the rod of correction. But you just don't correct with the belt and with the switch. Sometimes you have to correct a man with conversations in the word and by example. And so instill obedience in them. Look at verses four through six. Listen, Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your strength. Moses now transitions to a common daily practice in Israelite customs and Jewish customs. Moses is now giving them what is called the Shema of Israel, S-H-E-M-A, named after the first word in this uh, 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 word in the verse in Hebrew. It means to hear. The Shema, it means to hear. What, what is Moses saying? They need to hear about God, about his exploits, about what he's done. Amen. Your children have to know that it wasn't always this good. They need to hear your God story. So they'll trust that, 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 that it wasn't just dad's muscle that got us here. It wasn't just his mind. It wasn't just his grind. That God was the economic engine that was pulling the strings. But he says, he says, this word to hear does not mean just to listen with one's ears, but it means that what is being said needs to sink in as verifiable action. Loving God is actionable. How? And then obeying and keeping his commands, not perfectly, uh, but, 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 but with some error, but with some dependence on God. Moses is not just wanting them to hear, but he wants them to heed God's word. Not just to observe the law, amen, but to obey it. This command transcends culture. It, 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 it's not just locked in ancient Near Eastern culture, the Shema of Israel. No, Jesus, when being questioned by a scribe, asked, what is the greatest of all commandments? You know what Jesus says? He says, the most important is, listen, Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. Now I'm in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 30. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is like unto it. What I love about Jesus, he takes us further than we want to go, that we might grow up. He says, verse 30, uh, Mark 12, verse 30, he says, love the Lord, the God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Verse 31, the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Can I make this here point to you? There are roughly 1,500 years from when Moses said it and when Jesus said it. And now that I've said it, it's another 2,000 years. You say, how do I leave a legacy? How do I build a legacy? And what's the blueprint? You teach them, amen, to love the Lord, the God, with all their heart, mind, body, soul, and strength, and to love others like they love themselves. Teach them to love God and treat people with respect. Why then does he so quickly and, and reply in this manner? Because this truth concerning the person, presence, and purpose of God has to be instilled in our youth. Why do we need them to love God? Because when they know who God is, they'll know who they are. And their identity needs to be shaped from a God place, amen, and not a worldly place. They need to be shaped, amen, by the word of God, amen. And, and listen, nothing shapes a child like hearing the father's voice. That's why when Jesus was baptized, it says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus had not done a single miracle. 
He had not healed. He had not turned water to wine. He had not, he had, he had, he had not stunned the people. He, he had not even started his ministry. And look what God says. God says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Father's children need to hear that you love them even if they come in last place. They need to know that, that I love you no matter what. When they get grown, here's what they need to know. I disagree with you, but I still love you. That I can disagree with you and still love they need It's nothing like hearing the Father say how much he loves you. I was 24 and a half years old. First time I heard my father tell me he loved me. But I made the point that when I had sons, every opportunity that I have, I would tell them how much I love them. We end every phone conversation. They can be leaving the house this evening. And the last words we always say to each other is, I love you. One is almost six feet tall. One is 5'10". They both pretty good with their hands. They all tatted up. Amen. You can mistake them for the common neighborhood street hootlum. Amen. If you didn't know, know them any better. Why did you bring that up, Pastor? Because that, 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 that affection uh, towards their father and the, and, the, and the affection from the father to them doesn't diminish their manhood. Your sons and daughters need to hear how much you love them. Because if you're not telling them that, some scumbag is going to tell them that. Some predator is going to tell them that. I'm not upset. I'm just passionate this morning. Here's the deal. They need to hear that they're loved by the Father, but they also need to hear that they're loved by God the Father. Amen. This is how we instill a legacy in them. This is how we ensure obedience. Amen. Because when I love you, amen, I don't do things to earn your respect. I don't do things to earn your approval. I do things because I love you. God has at the center and circumference of all of life these expectations. We love God. We love others. We love the commands. We love his church. We are actively spiritual as Christians and we live out our lives before them in such a way that what they see in us they want to be a part of. You ever notice when your kids were little when kids are little, they do exactly what they see the parents doing. They even put on your shoes and try to fill your shoes. Your sons one day, man, around about 12 or 13, if you're not careful, you'll catch them in the, in the, in the mirror trying to shave if they see you doing that. Catch this, though. But if we're not careful to, sh to build a legacy, over time... We could become irrelevant in their lives. We could become the missing factor and other voices they will begin to hear rather than the voice of the father. And here's the deal. Right now, while they're little and they are in the uh, stage of being in, in, influenced and, and, and they're in the stage of being shaped, they need to hear the father's voice through the father. I know this is not popular teaching, but it's just Bible. When Moses was writing to Israel, he was speaking to fathers, your sons and your grandsons. And, 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 if you, and, and I, now I'm a grandfather, and I was reading this week in Deuteronomy 4 and 9, it says that you are to leave a legacy to your, to, to your children's children in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 9. They got to see it. They got to hear it. They got to feel it. To know that it's real. When I'm in prisons, when I'm in prisons, and I talk with these young inmates, the number one factor that they all have in common, 85% or more, is that they did not have a father's voice in their lives. 
Men, here's what I'm telling us. We can change all that's going on in the culture. If we will simply, if we will simply man up and stand up and speak up. That's why I love the men here at HEC. I love the way that they are fathering their children, loving their wives. I brag on these men all the time here at this church. Uh-huh. I've been to some parties. I've saw them at recitals. And I, I, I saw them at the judo matches and at the ball games. I, I, I saw them making space to be dads. And so your job, dad, is to pour loving truth into them. And if they stray, amen, you ought to always be the desired destination of what it looks like to them. If they get lost and they don't know what to do, they should think, man, what will dad do? What would my father do? Amen. Because you've poured so much of Godness into them, so much of so much of God love into them that right away, amen, if they stray, they're like the prodigal son that they say, I know where I can go to. Amen. I can always go back to my father. No matter how far they go out there, dad, always leave the light on. Always leave the door open. Always be looking and be just like the prodigal dad that if they go astray, but when you see them coming back, don't wait on the porch for them to get there. Run to them and embrace them and tell them how much you love them. Long after we are in the grave, our children's children should be saying, I got this from my dad. I got this from my papa. I got this from my nana. And it shouldn't be a rude attitude. It should be a love for the Father in heaven. Teach them to obey as only God has called us to obey. Here's the last point. Instruct them well. Instruct them well. You say, Pastor, now give us that again. You, 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 you were moving at a pace that, that seemed a little fast. Number one, amen, ensure that they know. Number two, instill in them obedience. Number three, instruct them well. Look at verses, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 7 through 9. These words I give you today, they ought to be in your heart. In your heart. No matter how often you whoop them, how often you beat them, amen, you can't get it in their hearts. You know what gets it in their hearts? When they know that what you're doing is motivated by love. Sometimes you got to go, son, I'm whooping you because I love you. The Bible says, whom the father loves, he disciplines. I'm putting this on you because I love you. I love you. But you know, discipline ought to come with instruction. That's why the old mom, the old grandma, um, they would whoop you and talk to you at the same time. Didn't I tell you not to do that again? I told you if you picked that up, if you touched that, if you did this, if you did that, I just say, oh, my God, why am I getting beat down like this? Not only did you remember the whooping, you remember the words behind the whooping. They had a way of tying the two together. Look here, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 7 through 9. These words I'm giving you today, they ought to be in your heart. Can I pause right here? Dads, sometimes they need to hear you reading the scriptures to them. Sometimes, dad, they 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 need you to grab their hands and pray with them. We love outreach here at the church. But we love outreach when the whole family is going. We want to do family missions trips where the whole family is going. Because that was the biblical intent. He says, these words I give you today ought to be in your heart. Now, verse 6, he's talking about us, parents, fathers. He says, my word 
should not just be in your head and on your mantle. It ought to be in your heart. Now, listen, listen. <clears throat> I know people, there are people who, who are big. Uh, they love memorizing all the scriptures. I just need to know it. I, I, I may not memorize it all. I just need to be able to locate it. He says, but it ought to be in your heart. In other words, I may not be able to quote it accurately. I may not have, have, the, have, the, have the verse all the way down, but if it's in my heart. Here, here's why that's important. This idea, here, here's what Moses is saying. He says, these words I'm commanding you ought to be deep down in your soul. But then he says, here's why they need to be in your heart. He says, because in moments of crises, you need to be able to repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and, and on your city gates. Here in Deuteronomy 6, 7, and 9, here, here it is. He said, instruct them well, right? How do we get God's word and God's ways in the hearts of the next generation? How, how can we create a heightened opportunity for spiritual legacy in our children and grandchildren and those whom lives we have influenced? I believe Moses is compelling the Israelites to do in practice and in principle what will work for us in priority and purpose. Moses is laying out a blueprint that goes beyond Sabbath school and children's church. This is for all my children's church workers. They're watching over there. Let me, let, me, let me give it to you. Listen, it's not the church's responsibility to disciple your children. We are a help, but we are not in the lead role. Our job is to equip you to be the equipper. I had a parent say, the church... The church ain't doing enough. The church ought to be doing this. I just turned after I couldn't take it no more. I said, so what are you doing? You know, the number one reason that children walk away from the faith after high school, it is because of the gap that they see, watch this here, at church and at home. At church, you are Brother Bobo. At home, you're the boogeyman. At church, you'll praise the Lord, sister, and fall out in the floor. And at home, you're throwing knives and glasses at people. At church, you're friendly with everybody. But at your house, it's like a hotel. You got a do not disturb sign on your room door. Because, because the gap is so big. They know you're not going to be perfect. My children know I wasn't perfect. Amen. But what they want to see is that gap close. They want to see they, they, they want to see that you're the same person in the pulpit that you are on the back that, that you're on the back porch. Listen, these words I give to you today are to be in your heart. Here's the first principle we must grab. The legacy of the next generation will be a result of the fruit and faithfulness of the current generation. Listen, listen. If it's not in you, you can't give it away. If it's not in you, you can't give it to the next generation. If it's not in you, listen, this here, don't do, don't, don't, uh, how, 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 how did they say it? Uh, uh, don't do what I do, do what I say. No. 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 That will no longer work. Our children are getting a million messages a month. You have to become the biggest voice in their lives if we're going to leave a legacy to the next generation. Proverbs 4.23 says, keeps your heart with all diligence or diligent because out of it flows all the issues or spring of life. Verse 7 says, repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in the house and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Listen, here's the second principle. Repetition and rhythm. How do you help your children love the God that you serve? Repetition and rhythm. Repetition and rhythm. Look at it. Look at it again. Recite it. Repeat it. Remind them of what the Lord requires of them. Recite it. Repeat it. And remind them. When my children would lie, my wife would bring them in. She said, go get the Bible. They was going to get the Bible in the butt whooping. 
But she would have them go read the Bible about liars. All liars should have their, uh, ha- have their place in the lake of fire. Amen. That's not how she did it, church. Go get that Bible. Amen. My children know that verse. Recite it. Repeat it. Right? Remind them of it. The only standard that matters is God's standard. Can I say that again? The only standard that matters is God's standard. God's standard has to be the highest standard in your home. This is the command. This is the statutes that matter. Right? He says, he says, get it. Pick me up verse 7. Now look at this here. Look at the rhythms. Talk about it when you sit at home. He says, he says, he says, what's going to happen to the next generation will not start at the church house, but will start at your house. It will not be a pulpit. It will, it will be something else that will set that ablaze. Catch this. He says, when you sit in your house. When you, lo- when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. He says, catch this now. He says, it starts at home, private and personal devotion and development. He says, when you, when you walk along the road, he says, even when you in public places, public and personal development, amen. My mama had this saying, she says, wherever you clown at is where you get it at. Amen. Wherever you clown at is where you get it at. <laughs> Amen. I had that same rule. I remember I was, I was disciplining one of my kids in the store, and the lady said, I'm going to call the police. I said, you can call the police. I said, but I got a better plan. You can take this joker home with you, too. <laughs> Let's see how you deal with him after a few days. Here it is. Then look what he says. He says, when you lie down, remind them of who God is. Bedtime stories. Amen. Don't let your children fall asleep on social media. Don't let Google and Facebook and social media and and whatever the latest game is, allow them to fall asleep like that because here's the truth. Whatever you fall asleep listening to is often on your mind when you wake up. He says, and when you get up, So look what he says. He says, when you're at home, listen, this is God's house. He says, you have to be like, as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. We don't do that in this house. We don't don't act like that in this house. He says, now listen, we get ready to go to bed. Go, Go take your shower, put your pajamas on, amen, and get on your knees. I'll be in there to pray with you. And when you get up, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Don't come in the kitchen with a stank, nasty attitude this morning. Amen. And you eat whatever mama put in front of you and you eat it with thanksgiving. Amen. Because guess what? The alternative to eating is not eating. It's hungry. You don't have to eat this, but I doubt if you can swallow enough spit to fill up your hunger. This is what we eat in a day. Only grandmamas have special menus. The rest of us are eating what mama cooked. Give them all you can for as long as you can, because you can. (laughs) Lastly, he says, bind them as a sign on your hands and let them be a symbol on your forehead. In in, in Jewish custom, they would write on scrolls and in little boxes, and they would literally tie them on their heads. Can I I, I tell y'all in the 21st century? Your kid would look strange walking around with little scriptures tied on ropes around them, but text it to them since you gave them all cell phones. (laughs) Amen. Give him a screen savior, amen, with the memory verse for this week on it. You say, Pastor, where are you going? What is it that you, you want us to get at? What is it you want us to know? I want you to build a lasting legacy. God's word, God's way, God's plan is the blueprint. Our legacy begins and ends with Jesus. I want you to consider Jesus' final prayer before he's crucified. How important are fathers and what they want to be passed on from generation to generation? 
Listen to what Jesus says in John 17, 22 and 23. Concerning legacy before he is crucified, buried, and before he raises from the grave. Look, listen to verse 22. I have given them your glory you have given me. This is Jesus talking to the Father. So that they may be one as you and I are one. Look at Jesus' desire. Jesus' desire was that all the children of God would know God and be with God. Then look what he says. I'm in them and you are in me. And so that they may be made completely one, that the world may know that you have sent me and I have loved them as you have loved me. Fathers. Love conquers all. But let's build a spiritual legacy that will last from generation to generation to generation. Let's make that our aim. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise this morning.